Acts chapter 10, verse 34. And Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The word which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses to all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him manifest, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God to be witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying this, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who came with Peter were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone forbid water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? But Peter began and explained to them in order, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, No, Lord, for nothing uncommon or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. And this happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. And these six brethren also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. And that's why we're here tonight, because we're Gentiles unto whom God has granted repentance to life. Where do you draw the line between God's people and others? There are some people whose answer is far too narrow and whose minds need to be stretched. There are other people whose answer is far too broad. Those who have too narrow an answer usually say, the people of God are my group, either my race or my denomination or my type. 
but they invariably limit the people of God to their particular set and that's too narrow a view. But on the other hand there are those who take far too broad a view of this question and think that pretty well everybody belongs to God except for one or two dictators and terrible criminals but pretty well everybody does. A man walking around a cemetery reading all the tombstones finally went to the grave digger and asked which cemetery they buried the sinners in in this part. And certain it is that it seems at most funerals that everybody's going to heaven and everybody will get there sooner or later so we don't need to worry. 98% of the British people are buried by a clergyman with words said over them assuring them that they are all right and in heaven. Well now we must get God's answer to this question. It must neither be too narrow nor too broad. Simon Peter was brought up with too narrow a view. He thought God's people were the Jews, full stop. And that you stood no chance of getting to heaven unless you belonged to the Jewish nation. And God was stretching that idea until he saw that his people were going to be much wider than that. That his people would have people in in them of every nation and every kindred and every tribe and every tongue. On the other hand, Peter did not fall into the opposite error and think that everybody or even most people, sooner or later, will get right with God and find their way to heaven. And so he began this sermon with a statement of his conclusion to which he'd just come. He confessed quite openly, I have had far too narrow a view of God's people. I thought they all had to be like me. I thought they all had to be Jews. Now I can see that God has no favorites. That's where we finished last Sunday evening. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Chinese or an African or an Indian or a British or an American. It doesn't matter. You stand just as good a chance of getting in on the right conditions. Indeed, it's certain that you will get to heaven and to glory, provided you fulfill the conditions. And there are two conditions which Peter starts with in this sermon. He says, I can see that it's not a matter of nation. And had he been talking today, he'd have said, I can see it's not a matter of denomination either. But he said, I can see that in every nation, a man who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now that's one of the trickiest texts in the whole of the New Testament. If that's the whole truth, then frankly Jesus never need die. If that's the whole truth, there's no point in talking about Jesus Christ. Because if a man fears God and does what is right, then he's in. If that's what it means, but it doesn't quite mean that, we've got to look at this text very carefully indeed. Not make it narrower than God has made it, not make it broader. What does it say? It does not say God accepts everyone. There is not a word in this Bible ever to suggest that God accepts everyone. It does say that God accepts anyone who, and then come the conditions. And the first condition is not who believes in God. Most people I meet today believe in God. I very rarely meet a convinced atheist. I meet a few agnostics. But nearly everybody I meet is at pains to tell me I believe in God. But that is not the, even the first condition here. The first condition is not to believe in God but to fear him. That's the first step towards reality. Somebody asked me recently, but isn't fear wrong? There's nothing wrong with fear if it's a healthy fear of the right danger. I hope my children will be afraid of traffic. I've taught them to be afraid of traffic. It takes us up to seven minutes to cross the Epsom Road in the morning, and the temptation is to see a gap and dash, and I want my children to be afraid of traffic. There's nothing wrong with that. If it developed into a phobia and kept them on the pavement out of sheer paralysis, then it would be wrong. But a healthy fear of traffic is a good thing. There's danger in traffic. And a healthy fear of fire is another fear that I want my children to have so that they don't do silly things on Guy Fawkes night and maim themselves for life. I want them to have a healthy fear of fire. And the beginning of a man's dealings with God are to have a healthy fear of God. There is danger to a man in God and it's healthy to fear him. Why does a man fear God? Because he's big, because he's powerful, because he can push me around being God? No. 
The healthy fear of God that is not a phobia is the fear of displeasing him by doing wrong. I was never afraid of my earthly father because he never, in my presence, lost control of himself. So I was never frightened of him, but I had a healthy fear of him. And that was a very different thing because I knew that my father was the sort of father who dealt with wrong and who punished it. Now that's a healthy fear. And one of the things that psychologists are telling us today is that there are scores of young people who only wish their parents had punished them, who only wish they'd had an earthly father who took wrongdoing seriously. Even if they rebelled and deserved punishment, they would rather have had the punishment than have earthly fathers who never take wrongdoing seriously. And this causes psychological damage in later life. There is a need to have a healthy fear of punishment. And a man who starts by fearing God and the punishment of his wrongdoing has taken the first step into a real relationship to God. One of the things that is desperately missing today is a fear of God. The idea that you can sow wild oats and get away with it later. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's no judgment. There's no punishment in the next world. There is no next life anyway. So you don't need to be afraid. Pay the fool. The bill will never come in. This is no way to find God. But Peter says, I can see that anyone can start finding God if they fear him. That's step number one. The fear of the punishment of God for doing wrong. Step number two is to realize that it does matter how you live and that you start trying to put it right. He who does what is right. And a man who does this has at least seen that God is a moral God, that he's a good God in the deeper sense of the word and that therefore he demands good lives in us. Now let me say straight away these two things don't save a man. They don't get him to heaven. But they get him into touch with God. For the word acceptable, which Peter now gives, does not mean saved, or Peter would have said that. If anybody who fears God and does what is right is saved, then there is no need of the cross, no need of the gospel, no need of Jesus, no need of anything like that at all. No need of the church, no need of the Bible. If you fear God and do what is right, you've got enough. But the word acceptable means to get a favorable hearing to begin to get an answer to your prayer, to begin to get through in conversation, God will begin to talk to a man who fears him and does what is right. And this is precisely what Peter saw. That's where the gospel begins. It does not end there, but that's where it begins. A man who fears God and knows that his life ought to be straight is a man to whom God will talk. St. Paul began that way, St. Augustine began that way, Martin Luther began that way, John Wesley began that way, Billy Graham began that way. You read their lives. You ask them how they first began to get serious with God, and you will find that the fear of God in an attempt to straighten out their lives was the first step. Would to God that we saw more of both. No wonder God isn't real to people. They don't fear him and they don't realize they should be straightening out their lives. But having said that, those two things do not take anyone far enough. They're a grand beginning. God will begin to talk to them. God will begin to help them and reward them with further truth that will save them, just as the angel came to Cornelius and said, Cornelius, send for Simon Peter, and he will tell you how to be saved. Making it quite clear that though Cornelius feared God and did what was right, that he was not saved yet. But at least God said, Cornelius, I begin with you because you're serious. I begin with you because you realize I'm good and you're bad. I begin with you because you've seen moral reality and you're going to do something about it and you realize that you can't play around with me and so I'm going to help you. But there are two things that a man does not have who fears God and does what is right. The first is he doesn't have any peace a man who fears the punishment of God and does what is right has no peace. This is a fact of life. You try it. Why doesn't that man have peace? For a very good reason. First of all, he's never sure if he's right enough. He is never sure if he's done enough good. He's never sure if he's really straight. 
And deep down in his heart he knows he's not, so he has no peace, he struggles and he strives to straighten out his life, and he can't get any nearer to that peace. And a man who just fears God and does what is right has no peace. Which is why Peter said, Cornelius, I've come to bring you the good news of peace. That's the thing you don't have. You fear God, you do what is right, but you've no peace. And God has sent me to bring you peace. And that peace comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, belief in God never brought anyone peace of a deep and lasting kind. You need to be led from fearing God to the forgiveness that is to be found in Jesus. Then you find peace. And of course, the other reason why a man who tries to do what is right never has peace is that even if he manages to live a perfect life from now on, that doesn't deal with what is on his conscience from the past. That doesn't deal with the wrong things he did in his earlier years, even if he could live a straight life now. So that a man who fears God and tries to do what is right has no peace. To find that, he needs Jesus. And the other thing he doesn't have is power. He struggles and strives and finds that though he tries to do what is right, he can't. He hasn't the power to achieve it. And that's why he needs the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you begin by fearing God and doing what is right, that's grand. That's a first step in the right direction. But you will not find peace that way and you will not find power. Because you've only found a third of God. And you need all of God if you're going to be saved. And all of God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you fear the Father and try and do what is right, no peace, no power. But if you find the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, there is peace. Because your past is forgiven and it is as if it had never been. And if you find the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, then there is power to achieve what is right. And so if you're going to know full salvation... Wherever you begin, you need ultimately to know Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost. And so Simon Peter said, Cornelius, I've seen an amazing truth since I stepped into this house. I would never have come into this house six months ago. I'm a Jew and I would never have sat down at a meal with you. I would have said, you don't belong to God. You're not God's people. You never will be. Now I can see that God has no favorites. Anyone in any nation can begin with God by fearing him. And doing what is right. That's what you've been doing, Cornelius. Well, I've been sent to tell you how you can be saved. You've begun right with God. You've faced up to moral issues. You've realized that your life needs to be straightened out. Some conversions are shallow and superficial because people never feared God before they were converted. They never faced up to moral issues. They never faced up to a God who punished wrongdoing. And therefore, they never found the joy and peace of forgiveness. They professed faith in Jesus. They said, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to belong to him. But they didn't know the joy and the peace that comes from knowing that all those wrong things on your conscience are literally forgotten and finished with and will never be brought up again. That's peace. Because it's the peace of a conscience that's clear. And then facing the future, those who know the Holy Spirit know power. Now let's look at Peter's sermon. He has already said, Cornelius, you've begun with God. You've started with God. God has listened to your prayer. God has started with you. You fear him and you know that your life should be straight and right. That's fine, but Cornelius, you need more than that if you're going to find peace with God and power of God. So he began to preach to him. Now in this brief sermon of Peter's, we've got a perfect summary perfect summary of what the Christian gospel is all about. He doesn't mention the church once because the good news is not the church. To talk about the church isn't good news. He doesn't mention the Bible as such though he refers to the prophets and he is an apostle but the good news is not good news about the Bible. He says the gospel is good news. It is not good advice. I sometimes cringe when I see what are called wayside pulpit notices outside churches. They're nearly always good advice. Don't worry, it may never happen. Jonah was down in the mouth, but he came out all right. That's one I saw in a church. It's all good advice. And the impression given to the passerby on the bus is that the church has nothing more to offer than good advice. I'm not here to give you good advice tonight. You can get that from the women's magazine or wherever. I'm here to preach good news. 
And the good news is good news not about the church, not even about the Bible. It's good news about Jesus, about a person. And this is the strength of the Christian faith, that we don't have to preach ourselves, we preach Christ Jesus. If we preached ourselves, you'd very quickly be disillusioned. You'd find out that we're just as you are. You'd find out we're just sinners, poor people, who do the wrong thing. But if I preach Jesus, I'm quite safe because you'll never, never be disappointed in him. Well now, what do we think about Jesus? There are three levels of understanding him. And they get deeper and deeper. The first level is Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter uses that phrase, Jesus of Nazareth. A man who lived in a particular place in a particular time. But if that's where your understanding of this person ends, then you will not find peace. The next level deeper down is Christ of Israel. And Peter uses that phrase too. The Christ of Israel. And that means he was not just a man living in a particular place. He was the final fulfillment of a thousand years of dreams. A whole nation dreamed of someone coming to get them out of their troubles, someone coming to be their king, someone coming to lead them. And he was the Christ of Israel. Even as he died, it was written on a notice above, it, above his head, this is the king of the Jews. But that's not a deep enough level for you to find peace. That's still something divorced from your life. The third level of understanding Jesus is he is Lord of all. And that means Lord of you. It means Lord of every nation. It means Lord of every person. And now at last we've got to an understanding of this person that affects my life. Jesus of Nazareth, if that's all I had to preach, then it's purely biographical interest. Christ of Israel, well that's a bit deeper, but it's purely national to the Jews. But Lord of all, that means he's the one who's going to judge the whole world. That means he's the one you're all going to see one day. It means he's the one you stand before and say, Lord, here's my life. You will have to judge it. Lord of all. And that's how Peter preaches him here. He starts with Jesus of Nazareth, says he was the Christ of Israel, and then he says, but he is Lord of all. And therefore, every man on earth is one day going to have dealings with Jesus Christ, whether he knows it or not, because Jesus is Lord of all. Who reigns over the earth? Who has the real power? Is it Harold Wilson? Is it the boys in the Kremlin? Is it President Nixon? Is it Mao Zedong? I'll tell you who has absolute authority in heaven and on earth, Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And things only happen on earth by his permission. He is Lord of all. Now, this is Christianity, preaching a person who is Lord of all. And yet there are certain facts about that person which are basic to understanding him. I notice that Peter didn't preach the personality of Jesus. He didn't even preach the character of Jesus. He preached the facts, certain objective facts. And here are the first. The first facts, he began his ministry at his baptism at the age of 30, and from then on he fought the devil for three years. God was with him, the devil was against him, and he won every time. That's a simple statement, but may I say that I don't think you'll ever understand Jesus unless you believe in a personal devil. You'll never understand what he was doing for three years until you believe that there is a personal intelligent being in the universe who is directly responsible for the troubles of men. When Jesus met a sick woman, he said, look at this woman, Satan has had her in his grip for 18 years and he set her free. And he was conscious of fighting a battle with not just evil but with the devil. And he won the battle every time because God was with him. Moving rapidly through that, Peter comes to the heart of what we need to know about Jesus. That men tried him and judged him and said he is not worthy to live. He deserves to die. He is a terrible man. He is a man who is lying. He is a man who is misleading multitudes of people. He is a man who thinks he's God and that is not true. And a man who says he's God deserves to die by the law and that was absolutely true. Any man who committed such blasphemy could not be allowed to live. And man's verdict on Jesus was he deserves to die. He's the worst man alive. But Jesus died appealing to a higher court. 
And Jesus said, I appeal to a higher judge than you. And I believe he will reverse your verdict and release me from custody within three days. Even the custody of death. And Jesus died with his case in God's hands. And three days later, God reversed the verdict and released Jesus from the punishment that men said he deserved. Which means quite simply that if that is true, then we must accept that Jesus was God. We must accept that what he said was true, what he said about himself was true, what he said about us is true. We must accept that one day every one of us will stand before Jesus. We must accept that he can do anything he says he can do, including forgiving, forgiving you. Which brings me to the end of Peter's sermon. It's a very condensed summary, I'm sure, of what he said. But you see the gospel. He didn't have anything about Christmas in it because the Christmas story is not really an essential part of the gospel. The gospel really begins with the baptism of Jesus, which is why so many can believe the Christmas story and not become Christians, and why they'll all be celebrating in just two months' time and still be no nearer God. The Christmas story doesn't save, and the recent pop song, and man shall live forevermore because of Christmas Day, is just not true. It's not Christmas that saved anyone. But from his baptism and the beginning of his battle with the devil, through to the cross and the resurrection, it is here that you see the meaning of the whole thing. And now Peter says, this is the choice. Either you face Jesus someday in the future to be punished, or you come to him right now to be pardoned. That's the choice. If you come now, you'll find peace. If you don't come now, you'll never find it. This is the good news, that the Jesus who will judge you is prepared to forgive you now, if you'll take your case now. That's the gospel. And there are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world who've come to Jesus Christ and said, take my case now, and I beg for pardon, and found peace, and know that they will never face him in judgment again. That's the good news that Peter offered to Cornelius. Cornelius, a man who feared God, a man who did what was right, and many people in the world would say, what more is required? That man will get to heaven. He fears God and does what is right. No, Peter said there's something more. You need forgiveness, and you need power. Jesus had the power. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost. He went about doing good. He wasn't trying to do good because he feared God. He was anointed with power, so he went about doing good. Cornelius, you need to be forgiven the past and anointed with the Holy Ghost, and then you can go about doing good as he did. It's so simple. Could it be simpler? It's straightforward. It's based on facts. It's not based on theories. It's not based, as Justin said earlier, on opinions or philosophy. Here are simple, straightforward facts. Jesus was baptized. That's a certain fact. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost. That's a fact. He went about doing good, healing those that were oppressed of the devil. That's a fact. They hanged him on a tree. That's a fact. An angel rolled the stone away and he came out again, God reversing the verdict. That's a fact. And you're going to meet him one day as judge. That's a fact. And you can come to him now for forgiveness, that's a fact. Isn't it wonderful to be able to talk about facts, real things that are true? Now, no sermon has ever had such an immediate effect on its congregation. There was Peter busy preaching, and suddenly, out of the blue, something happened. It stopped Peter's sermon dead, just like that. I don't know if he was going to go on preaching. I have the feeling he was from what he said later. But suddenly, something happened. Those people listening, Gentiles who didn't belong to the chosen race of Israel, as they listened, they believed, and suddenly the power came, just descended on them. The Holy Ghost was poured out and fell. And they spoke in tongues and extolled God. That's exactly what happened to all the other Christians up till now. It had happened to every one of them, and now it was happening to these Gentile people. It's funny, you know, but those who have no knowledge or experience of the gift of tongues get all tied up in that part of it. But I want to tell you that the biggest miracle is extolling God. The tongues were the means, the end was extolling God. There can be demonic tongues which curse God. There can be psychological tongues which do nothing to God at all. 
But the real gift of the Holy Spirit praises God. That's why it's given, to give praise to God. But the important thing is, here are people praising God who once feared him, loving him, who once shrank from him. That is the difference that the Holy Ghost makes. Fear is transformed into love because perfect love casts out fear. A man who fears God and does what is right does not extol God, which means to praise him. And all the people I meet who say, well, I believe in God and I don't harm my neighbor and I try to help people when I can, they don't come to praise God. You don't hear them singing about God at the tops of their voices. You don't hear them extolling God because they have not yet found peace. And until you found peace with God, worship is drudgery. And I don't blame an unbeliever who comes to a service of worship and says, how dull and how dead. Because we're here to extol God tonight. We're here to say, ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name. Who's going to do that until they've found peace? If you just fear God and are trying to live an upright life and trying to do what's right, you won't want to sing like that. My song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me, love to the loveless shown that we might lovely be. You hadn't an ounce of fear in your heart as you sang that, because love casts out fear. And here are Cornelius and all these people filled with the Holy Ghost, and no longer is it fearing God, now it's loving him. They've found peace with God, and so now welling up within them is praise, and out it comes in glorious language God-given. And Peter just stands back and, and then turns them all into Baptists. <laughs> and he says, now then he says, who can stop them being baptized now? Now there are some people I meet who say that if a person's filled with the Holy Ghost and believing in Jesus, they don't need baptism. Don't you listen to them. This is the very best form of expressing such a faith. It's saying, I, I believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus. I know it to be true because I've died, I've risen to new life in the Holy Ghost. And now I want to express this and identify myself with the death and resurrection. I want to be buried. I want to be raised. And Peter said, now this is the next thing. You see, there are four things that are needed to make a person fully a Christian. Four things that belong, in a sense, to Christian initiation. Repentance which only comes if you fear God. Faith, which only comes when you hear about Jesus. Baptism in water, which he commanded every believer. And confirmation of the Spirit, to be sealed and anointed with God's Holy Spirit. Here are the four things. And if the order varies a little in Scripture, you'll notice that in every case, all four were needed. And so Peter says, well, they've obviously got three. They've repented. This man fears God. And he's straightened out his life. He believes, obviously, in Jesus. Look at their faces. They have already been confirmed with an anointing of the Holy Ghost. Then who can forbid water? And they had a baptismal service, and Peter stayed a few days. Now, just three more minutes. When Peter got back to Jerusalem, he was in trouble with the church members of the church of which he was a pastor, they did not like their pastor doing such things. And they said, Peter, why did you, you are pastor of the Jewish Christians, we hear you've been mixing with all sorts of people. You've been outraging our traditions. I remember talking to a minister of a church in Manchester, and the minister felt led of God to go out on Piccadilly in Manchester in the early hours of the morning, night after night, talking to the women of the streets about Jesus Christ. And he ran straight into his church members. They didn't like their pastor doing this kind of thing. They said to Peter, who have you been mixing with? You've been going into the uncircumcised. They were shattered. And so Peter told them the whole story. He said, it wasn't my decision. I'll tell you who did it all. It was God. I had a vision. I got a message. Three men came to me and they told me that an angel had spoken to Cornelius and I went and I preached to them. And as I preached, exactly the same thing has ha happened to us, happened to them. God confirmed them. And if God confirmed them, who, could, who was I that I could withstand God? God did it. You mustn't ask, why did you? You must ask, why did God? 
That was a powerful defense. The best form of defense is attack. And he just stuck to the facts. And he said, God did it. This is the final test. The fellowship of the Spirit is the test of real human relationship. And if other people have the Spirit, you must meet together. If the same Holy Spirit is in them as is in you, you cannot keep away from them. And so Peter said, there it was. It was God. And I thank God that the Jerusalem church members got over their prejudice and rose to the occasion. At first they were silenced because you can criticize somebody else, but you can't ever argue against God if God does something. So they were silenced at first, and then they rose to the occasion. And they said, you mean God did this? Yes. You mean God sent you there? Yes. You mean God gave them the Holy Spirit just as he gave it to us? Yes. Then glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? And they glorified God that Gentiles were going to belong to the people of God. And in that moment, they caught a vision, too, of a church that would include every race, every color, every background, every type of man. And that is the church as it is today. When you get to heaven, you'll be amazed at the United Nations you'll meet there. When you see the great multitude that no man can number, you'll see every color of skin you can imagine. I nearly said black and white, but there's no such thing. Pink and brown and all that there is. You'll see them all there. And perfectly united in the fellowship of the Spirit. And they caught a glimpse of this. And so back to where we started. Peter said, I used to be very prejudiced. I used to think that you had to be a Jew to get to heaven. I used to think you had to belong to my set, to my nation, to my group. Now I've seen the truth. Anyone, not everyone, anyone, anyone in any nation who sees that God is a righteous God and fears the punishment that is due for wrongdoing, God will begin to talk to that man and he'll tell him the truth that will save him. And I can see that God could come to any man and bring peace through Jesus Christ and give him the power of the Holy Ghost. That is why this church is here tonight. That is why I'm here tonight. That's why Justin is here tonight. We're both Gentiles to whom God granted repentance to life, real life. And that is why it is not enough just to believe in a God and not enough just to try and live a good life and try and help your neighbor and not do anybody any harm. That brings no peace and it brings no power. But God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit together can bring you all the power and peace that you need. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that over 2,000 years the gospel hasn't changed one bit because human nature hasn't really changed. And we thank you that Peter's words are perfectly adequate for everybody's need here. Lord, we've heard the gospel again tonight of Jesus who lived and who died and who rose again, who will come again to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. We pray now, O oh Lord, that you will help anyone who has not yet found this to be true to fear you, to realize that one day you must punish wrongdoing if you are to be a good God, but to realize that it is not your wish that any should perish, that your great love provided a way of forgiveness of life, of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We pray now that you will bring us to a full experience of all that you have for us and send us away rejoicing through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.